This is the third series in the third year indeed of the Laureateship of podcasts that I have made with some of my fellow writers in which I ask what the hell stroke heaven it is that we do. Not expecting or even needing an answer, but in not getting an answer, maybe some signpost directions towards an answer. I really hope you enjoy them. So today I'm talking to, amazingly to me, uh, Thomas Kilroy, whom I last met on stage in 1989 when we were doing a reading together. And the thing I remember most warmly about him, I was about 34 and I was terrified. But when I started to read from what I had to give to the audience, I could hear his warm uh, and genial laughter behind me. Uh, and I sort of never forgot that because he, he took the terror out of the moment. Um, sometimes by noticing the terror in the moment in his work, he's taken the terror out of the greater moment. Uh, many moments in Irish history have been cauterized by Thomas Kilroy, uh, healed by them. In his plays, he's written about many things. He's written about the quandary, for instance, of being gay uh, in the 1960s and 70s in Dublin. Uh, he's written about uh, abuse by priests at school. Um, Christ Deliver Me is that play. From the point of view of fiction, he's the author of one novel. But if you're only going to write one novel, this is the way to do it. It's called The Big Chapel. This is the old Faber edition from 1971. In that year, it won the Guardian Fiction Prize. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in the third year of the Booker, and it won the Heinemann Prize. And you can see why, because it is a book that really is of, uh, rises to the heights of a Dostoevsky in parts, and it has um, a tremendous a dancingness and adroitness, especially in the dialogue. It is quite an astonishing book, and it has been reprinted a number of times since. So it should be um, should be available. Um, apart from that, uh, Thomas Kilroy just belongs to that sort of eternal generation of great writers, writers who lived in the 18th century, in the 21st century, or any century. When you put them together, they are of a permanent uh, and equal stature. Uh, it's been such, it, it will be, and it is a privilege to talk to him. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just excited to do it. When we were sharing a stage in France, do you remember that for Belle Etrangère? Oh, yes. And I was, as, as Crosby, Stills and Nash said at, 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 at Woodstock, I was scared shitless. And I read from Bosquet's Boys, which was yeah. my first play. Yeah. And behind me to my left, you were sitting. And I heard you laughing <laughs> in this wonderful appreciative, with, uh, the way you're doing now in this second. And that, that, was, like, that was like release from I fear. <laughs> so thank you, 30 years later. Thanks for the laughter. <laughs> that was an extraordinary occasion. Wasn't it? I mean, I, because of that one moment in 1989 yeah. of your kindness or whatever that was, your um, geniality, or I don't know how you'd yeah. characterize it. I've always considered you a sort of friend in the way, and I've never seen, we've never seen each other since, but that doesn't matter in a way. It doesn't matter no. actually, no. <laughs> because when we were young writers, didn't yeah. we have very deep friendships with maybe Yeats or yeah. Joyce through the letters? Yeah. And maybe we made an assumption about their friendship with us. But still, that was important to feel of that course. they were possible. Of course. Who would you have, in the Irish tradition, were there people you would have connected with when you were 22? Actually, George Moore isn't too far oh, from, from uh, uh, and we ended up um, living in a village not very far from Carnacon, mm. uh, where we are now in uh, Kilmaine That's and uh, Mayo. Haven't you written a play about more hall. I have indeed written a play, and I was talking about this last night <laughs> <laughs> in the Abbey to somebody. I don't know how, why it came up. 
Uh, oh, it came up uh, because of the Royal Court uh, and uh, Max is involved in this. I wrote this play for a one-off performance in the village of Carnacon in the, the local hall. Mm, I know and, the village. Uh, uh, the idea was that it would be uh, uh, a piece of uh, docudrama mm -hmm. uh, involving George and his... His brother, maybe? His servant. Oh, his servant. Okay. His male servant, ah. whom he took to Paris, ah. and this male um, uh, gobshite. <laughs> and I'm sure he wrecked many salon <laughs> get-togethers for for uh, more. But um, we, at that stage, uh, Mark Lambert. Mm and Tom Hickey were playing for Max in the court. Mm. I can't remember what they were doing. Mm. And uh, I, um, unknown to Max, arranged to get the two boys over for a Sunday night reading performance in the, the mm. Carnacon, mm. with Tom Hickey playing the servant and Max playing, and uh, Mark playing uh, George. When the Max, Max heard what I had done, <laughs> All hell broke loose. He was absolutely infuriated really? that if something had happened, that uh, the insurance wouldn't cover it. Oh my God! <laughs> they were not supposed to be outside the island of the United Kingdom, you know, I see. during a run in the court. Uh -uh. And uh, I didn't appreciate quite what I was doing, but we got them to no. Knock Airport and got them back from Knock Airport oh, I for course. the Monday night performance. There's something strangely post-colonial about that. I can't quite identify what it is, but yeah. they are our actors, yeah. and surely they can play in Mayo if we if we want them to. Yeah. And Tom Tom Hick, Tom Hickey. I well, mean, they, they they were totally game for it. Yeah. And thought it was wonderful. But a genius, no Tom. And and oh yes, absolute genius. Mm. And uh, you know they did what about three hours uh, rehearsal in mm. the afternoon on mm. Sunday, and then they went on on Sunday night. And that was it. Mm and there was no more of it. But he didn't want it. He didn't want that inheritance, did he, more? He wanted his, he gave it to his brother, is that correct? He did, he gave it to the, uh, um, but he followed very closely what oh, happened to Did it. he? Yeah. And, um, and the colonel uh, became a senator in the new state. Um, so ah, it was ah. a kind of a, um, it was a strange family. And, and it's a strange did. house. When you go to see it, it's this great big, looming, lowering, lowering house. It, it really yeah. is an yeah. extraordinary. And that weird servants drive out the back, yes. going down into the bowels yes. of the, the building. Yes. Uh, so the servants are not seen. The subterranean Catholics. <laughs> That's ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But they'd yeah. have driven us away from the front door, you know. Oh, God, completely. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the Around the back with you, down into the underground. <laughs> Go down the back way. But um, it was a family that was uh, riddled with uh, contradiction, uh, religious contradiction. Mm. There were Catholics in different generations, mm. side by side with the Protestants. And, yeah, uh, but not so, not so unusual, yeah. in truth, yeah. when you look at it closely. Yeah. When Nell McCafferty, that moment she discovered she had two uncles in the RIC, do you know that yeah. sort of? Yeah. Well, you realize you have to, which is what the recent controversy really about her memory Yes, uh, I think, she may correct me, maybe it was great uncles. Yeah. Um, commemorating the DMP and the RIC, yeah. uh, this controversy that was quite recent, it does, it's ignoring the fact they that- they come after you on this issue? You no, know, I've tried to no. keep out of it. I mean, my, obviously my great grandfather was in the DMP. Yeah. It destroyed that generation of the family. Yeah. He was, it, it, so much so that no one knew even where he was buried yeah. in Glasnevin yeah. till Dermot Bulger. I was in with Dermot on the year's mind for his lovely wife, wife's Bernie's um, burial. And Dermot in his beautiful way brought me to the, to the little office where you can look on the screen on the internet or wherever it is. Of the occupants. Mm. And, and we found the steward who was cozied in with his wife and my great aunt and some of the children who died young. And in the same family. But no, 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 but there was nothing, only a patch of earth. 
a patch of or earth. Or no stone or anything. Because none, no one in the family wanted him remembered. And his, one of his sons, who had been in the British Army, was told, the, the, his, the father was told that if he didn't leave the country, they'd shoot him, fled to Chicago, uh, probably from the North Wall. And sometime later, walking along the street in Chicago, he was shot dead by Clan oh, Nail or something. Again, we were, they were, the family was told that he was an engineer who had died in an accident in a reservoir. Nobody reservoir. wanted him, yes. Nobody wanted him to be shot by, the, by Collins' men in America. Yeah. So there was this, this forgetting. But as, as has often been said, the DMP were never armed. Yeah. Once the young recruit was shot at the gate of St. Stephen's Green, whether or not by Markovitz, yeah. we don't know, they took them off the streets. The RIC were brought into Dublin. The DMP they were, were not, unarmed, of course. They were unarmed, so they yeah. took them off the streets for 1916. Yeah, I remember my father talking about the, that fact, the model mm. of the unarmed police force. Mm. We had one of our own here. Absolutely. And it was a big debate. Yeah. And indeed, in 1922, they agreed to hold the city yeah. until the Gardaí, Came eventually along. with yeah. whom your father worked, could be put in place. And 60% of the new Gardaí were all DMP Of men. course they were, yeah. Now you talk about that in your memoir. I do. That they were slightly, that some of the new guards there were uncomfortable. There was the, uh, um, the Kildare Mutiny. Mm. And the Kildare Mutiny was uh, literally a mutiny of the new recruits uh, um, in uh, Kildare. Uh, against the employment of mostly RIC people. Oh, RIC, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, yeah. You know, it would be mostly RIC. Yeah. Uh, but Collins knew exactly what he was doing. He was mm -hmm. getting a fully trained uh, cadre of officers mm -hmm. at the top of the new police force, Absolutely. which would actually make it a police force. Mm -hmm. But uh, the and boys by, weren't by 1922, 90 percent of the DMP were for Collins anyway, yeah. because he had infiltrated the yes. whole organization. Yeah. These, but these, these things that are true aren't, no longer, they, they fall into half-truth or mistruth or lies yeah. in the ears of so many people, even now. That's what I found shocking oh, about. This is it, this is it. I mean, the, there, there are no straight lines, mm. you know, in this kind of... And it's all our tapestry, right? It's all our yeah. story. And uh, as you know yourself, it's, um, um, it's a complete compendium of different things going mm. on. Highly contradictory, and, uh, but that's the way it should be. Absolutely, and I was also reading that, um, I like seeing, listening through the floorboards in Wicklow, not yeah. in Mayo, it was actually in Wicklow, I know the house, to the servants talking oh, below. Yeah. <laughs> you used to hear your father through, through the floorboards listening to Lord Lord ha -ha. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. What is this riveted tradition in Irish literature of listening through the floorboards? <laughs> riveted attention. <laughs> <laughs> and he had two or three local farmers who were um, old IRA men. Hmm and they were totally uh, passionate about the defeat of the English. Hmm. That was what, what really mattered. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, the notion of anything else involved. This is in Callan. In, in Callan. And w was there a voice in Callan who would have been critical of that, or w was that the general feeling in oh, the town? Yes, yeah. um, Callan was a, um, it wasn't a garrison town in the sense that it didn't have hmm. a kind of a, an, an English army. Um, barracks in the place, but it had a very strong tradition of uh, me local men joining the British Army, hmm. and there was, they lived in uh, an area of the town, outside the town, called the Commons, wow. the Commons Cottages, and these were where the British Army uh, veterans came. When they came home, hmm. And when they came from the home, first war or the second war? The second world war, mm -hmm. but um, uh, and I think probably going back, mm -hmm. you know, for further back. Mm -hmm. So you had this element of working class, very tough mm -hmm. um, uh, followers of the empire mm -hmm. and of the king, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it was a strange, a strange kind of mix. So we had regular faction fights mm. between them and the local nationalists, <laughs> what right. you call them. Which Arranged or accidental? Huh? Arranged fights or, or accidental fights? Oh, very, very much planned, you know. <sighs> and uh, he would be down there with the blackthorn stick trying to separate them. And, of uh, course, ask the policeman. Yeah. But his heart. <laughs> <laughs> his heart was with the yes. Get the British Army at all costs. But he, he, is, he was a strange mix, my father. You know, he was uh, so much of his kind of um, inner feeling mm. and inner thoughts mm. about kind of life and what it was all about and where are we going and the rest of it. Mm. Um, run counter to the kind of received mm. Irish Catholic nationalist mm -hmm. thing. See, I think that running counter actually defines us as a people. Yeah. The glory of us as a people is that we do run counter yes. even to our supposed yeah. accepted truths. Yeah. So, but, and this father, I mean, could you say, just as a person estranged from his own father, that's yeah. my father, in the, in the conditions of the times, like the, that's the 30s and the 40s, were you affectionate? Was he affectionate towards you? Were you close to each no, other? No, he wasn't. I was, no. I was a kind of uh, a geek. You know, I was a kind of with, with glasses and uh, uh, head in the books and uh, everything that ran counter to. He was a very macho, very, very, very much into the masculine image of himself. Right. Mm. Uh, I mean, I didn't see it like that at the time, but that's mm. where it was. And I would have been a weakling in the family, you mm. know, and, and indeed I had bad health as a kid. Mm. So um, everything went, was not working there at all. Mm. And it was only much later when I started to write and got a bit of attention mm. that he suddenly changed. Yeah. See, that's the use of PR, Tom. <laughs> Absolutely. You <laughs> can reconcile your father to you. Isn't that something that... Yeah. That's a common story, I'm sure. I'm sure it is, too. You know? Well, I mean, the McGaffron story is, is mm. an interesting... Mm. Exactly. Uh, ...version of that. Mm. With uh, violence in, in, oh, in very, added very Incredibly in. violent. Mm. And, uh, but a similar story in that his father was a policeman also. Same story, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, Dermot Healy, <laughs> the late Dermot, used to say it was the, uh, the, the day school, the day room school of Irish writing. <laughs> My girlfriend and his father, Healy's father, was a no. guard. No. I can only claim a great grandfather. It's not as good. It's not as good. That's where I've gone wrong. <laughs> My father was a pesky architect. That's, that's no use whatsoever. There's a couple of more. Yeah. In, 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 your, in your amazing memoir, and, and in case I forget to say it, when I read, read The Big Chapel over the last few weeks, which is your one book, but if you're yeah. going to have just one book, that's, that's the way to do it. Yes. Because it seemed to me that there, there were Dostoevskian heights in that book. Most amazing book. Yeah. And when you were, um, when you come to your, the bits of poetry that you think can be contained in prose, I was thinking then of Edward Thomas. I don't know if you yeah. have any yeah. grow for him whatsoever. Anyway, I had this incredible experience. I was converted to Edward Thomas uh, by uh, Enda. Ah, and the Longley herself. That would have been after writing the Big Chapel, would it? It would have been after writing yeah. the Big Chapel. Yes. You are you were already secretly converted. You yeah. just didn't know. Uh, the, yes, I suppose in a sense, uh, yeah. And there's just kind of parallel lines or mm. something there. Mm. But he's he's a wonderful poet. Uh, yes, and w what I wanted to say was, um, it, you describe at the beginning of your memoir that, yeah. or your memory book, as you call it the, well, I suppose by now a famous story of, of getting your cataracts removed. Yeah. Uh, leading to um, almost a visionary state of being where, and you say that John Berger had the same experience and the, the crucial color that he so enriched after his cataract operation was blue. Yeah. 
and your color after was your red. operation was red. Yeah. Because it was your mother standing on the red floor. Why the red floor for you, do you think? I don't know what, they painted some kind of red paint. Mm. And uh, he did the painting himself. Mm. Your dad? He painted, yes, and would regularly do up the floor. It's very and Roy it Foster, he does the same thing. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> It is a strange. He's always painting the floor, Roy, for some reason. But anyway, we'll, we'll go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but your mother standing on the, fa the, the paternal floor. Yeah. Because one of my questions to people when I've been doing this is on the question of uh, what, it, what the hell heaven is it that we do? Um, one of the questions is, is it, is it all the mammy's fault? See, I feel in your case, your father and his stories and even the things you heard through the floorboards were crucial to you somehow in that very peculiar chemistry and mathematics of what makes a writer. But what about that lady standing on the red floor? Do you, what do you feel she had? What did she do to you to make a, to make a writer of mm. you? Well, she was a reader. Mm. I mean, most of the reading was uh, kind of uh, rubbishy stuff mm. from the library, but... Uh, mm. Um, um, I remember she devoutly read The Messenger. Do you remember The Messenger? Mm -hmm. I do, I do. My <laughs> grandfather used to get that. And um, stuff like that. She did mm. about the Kiltegan Fathers and... Uh, the Kiltegan Fathers? Yeah, they're... they're I know about that, yes, because yes. Stuart of Christendom was Kil Kiltegan Kil set. Kiltegan. Yes. That's right. Kelsha, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, they were missionaries, right? So they had a little magazine. They had a magazine of oh. some kind, yeah. if, if I remember. Maybe it was the other crowd, the Columbans. Okay. And one or other, them, but yeah. uh, those magazines were proliferating around the place. Yeah. But uh, the books were kind of, I, I don't know, they were love stories or whatever. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But she had a sense of writing. Yes. And uh, I mean, I had this uh, thing with Mr. Roach where I am. Um, uh, got a great deal of um, flack mm -hmm. because of the gay thing mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, some of this flack came from my siblings, hmm. my older siblings hmm. who were uh, absolutely distraught at the prospect of my mother and father seeing this play at the end of the week on mm -hmm. Saturday mm -hmm. they were going to come up from Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. This is the death and resurrection yeah. of Mr. Roach. Yeah. And, um, they were totally, my mother and father were totally accepting of the play. Hmm. And he um, took me aside and said, you know, uh, I have a couple of, of stories that I, from my days in the, the force hmm. that uh, were a lot more shocking than what you <laughs> If you want them for the play, for, for the, the next play. For the next play. And she was only concerned about the, the, the condition of the man who had had this encounter with a gay man. Mm -hmm and uh, her sympathy for him was so it's almost like the generation uh, did a skip you yes. know the, the, the generation after my parents generation yes lost some of that uh, catholicity yes you know there's openness yes uh, and i think of it in relation to irish farm life you know they're coming from farming background uh, as they did from a farming community uh, that this helped. Whereas the new generation of my brothers were the new Ireland, uh, the new middle class, yes. and uh, felt threatened by anything like this. Yes. Well, it's in the old literature. And in fact, all that's edited out of the Toyn yeah. in the old editions. Yeah. But it's there, you know, the, the love between Cucullin and who, who was the man he killed. Of course killed. it is. Do you, do you consider yourself, a ch in that sense, a champion of, of the gay movement or of gay people, um, an ally? I, I certainly felt a great deal of sympathy, you mm. know, mm. but it's, it's kind of tea and symphony, you know, sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, it doesn't get you very far. Um, I wouldn't have known enough. Mm. I would be mm. literally quite ignorant. Mm. I mean, Frank McGuinness. Mm. Uh, said that this is not a play about homosexuality at all, it's a mm. play about heterosexuality, yes, you yes, know? Yes. And it's about the fuck-ups of the, uh, the Irish male uh, gathered together. 
yeah. uh, and enlarged. Yeah. And he's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, I said this to him. I said, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I, and just clear in the writing, mm. I, I hadn't a clue mm. what the whole gay thing was mm. about, mm. except that it was this mm. uh, potent mm. threat mm -hmm. uh, to males that I knew, yes. uh, as indeed it was. Um, so um, I, I think it's it's. Uh, Maybe the, maybe it, uh, I was lucky to be innocent. Yeah, I saw the death and resurrection of Mr. It must have been in the eighties. Would it have been? There was a revival uh, of the in the Abbey. Yeah, yeah, I, I would have seen. It. 80s, which yeah. it's which is a, it's a devastating play to yeah. see. And the curious thing of my memory of that play is that it is about uh, I don't know the despairing the despairing atmosphere that surrounds Irish maleness. Yeah. That's what I remember. I don't even remember the gay, the thing. gay element yeah. of it. Um, but now that it, now that it's, if it was played now, that would be very clear yeah. uh, and important yeah. element in it. And that's the test of a play, I think, is that it will seem like a different story almost yes, in a, different, in a yeah. different decade. The revivals are strange like that. Yeah. Because they do tell different stories. Yes, absolutely. And um, it's uh, yes. you'd wonder what the relationship is to the original. <laughs> but, yeah, even what the relationship of the original is to you yeah. as an individual. Yeah. Since if you've let enough years pass, you may yourself have to some degree forgotten the entire text. Yes. So you're reading it for the first time. Yeah. Thus, uh, when I write a novel, if it's any, unfortunately, if it's any good, when I'm proofing it, I won't remember large stretches of it. Yeah. That's a bit scary because you realize it's nothing to do with the posh grand top of your head. If there is such a thing. gone into your it's somewhere completely different. Yeah. In fact, uh, you talk about uh, that the imagination might be beyond the reach of academic analysis. Mm. And I agree. Because the very act of making a story is in, to me, so mysterious, so unlikely, yeah. so unexplained. What do you think that might be? I mean, you've given your life now to this. Mm. It's kind of an alternative history, you know, okay. in some fashion. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's uh, you know this you're, from your own experience, uh, history is a very important part of fiction making. Mm -hmm and the use of history, the use of uh, um, historical documentation or whatever mm. to bolster the imagination's journey mm -hmm. um, um, brings the two very close together. Um, and I think it is, yeah, an alternative history, mm. Mm. alternative to the reality, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sort of instinctively like your attitude to the world. I've sometimes seen you being quite clear about your opinions about things. And I was noticing in my, I was looking into writing as a thing. Yeah. Of course, um, the early linear B writing was lost yeah. in Greece. So then there was this few hundred years of oral composition. And when they came back with the Greek alphabet, then Homer was able to collate everything and possibly, who knows, write it down. Yeah. So that really means, people think, oh, well, then writing began and that's the posh bit of it, that's the good bit. But what about that oral? Don't you think that those hundreds of years of oral composition, composition were essential to Greek civilization and also to us as... Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I think orality of some kind mm. is in the written word. Mm. And it's, uh, I was going to say entombed on the written word, but mm. it's, uh, it's uh, firmly planted in, in the written word, mm. uh, and particularly the written word of, uh, of plays, mm. uh, where the, the oral, the whole identification of character is through the oral, is through a voice, and um, uh, it's the unlocking of that voice. Mm. Um, um, then the only trouble is that it's it, it can st it will stay forever. The only trouble is to, get, to shut it up. You yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> who uh, were the ones who helped you, Tom, in when you were starting out? Ben Kiley. Ben, there you go. We have this in common. Ben was was an extraordinary presence, and 
um, because of his equanimity, you know, mm. the fact that uh, um, it hadn't gotten to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was there in uh, some kind of buttressed yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> hogshead of porter. Uh, and sweetness, though. And sweetness. You know, hogshead of sweetness. Yes. <laughs> but he'd burst out then into rages. Oh. He used to go into a rage oh. at, at um, parish priests having holidays. Right. And of course, that that's he very himself annoying. Has never had the chance of a holiday. <laughs> because he was a writer. Because he was a writer. He was a parish and a writer. And a drinker. <laughs> and a drinker. <laughs> but uh, he was certainly there. Mary Lavin. Mm. And Mary was very, um, even though I, I couldn't write short stories, mm. as in Capel, of writing a short neither, story. Me neither. But um, um, she, um, she had that kind of passionate support. Mm. And she supported a lot of people, mm. you know, like Nuolo Fuelon. Mm. Uh, a benign presence, Mary Yeah, Lamb. yeah. One of the things you say in passing, you know, over the backyard wall is, you were very interested in the fact that prose could have some of the detailed uh, effects of poetry. Uh, and I, I want, of your grace, just to read one paragraph, I think, which illustrates that. Surely. And it's that little bit there at the bottom of the page. And this is my feeling about these passages in your book, when you talk about the detailed effects of poetry, that there is an Edward Thomas, and as you know, Thomas's first poems were, were stolen out of his prose books because Frost yes. or somebody said, you know, you could make poems out of some of these passages. And that's the way he came about Yeah, it. that's how he got mm. to it. Okay, this is uh, the extract. The air above the river was like blue water in motion. At the observatory window, he stood and felt he could hear the contented chuckle of water over stones. Then he saw the couple away below him on the river bank. The other scully boy and that girl. Young foals in pasture. Not walking, but wading through the long rushes and the switchgrass. Creatures of the river in their natural place. Her long black hair was tied back and she tossed it like a young filly as she made short runs, letting the clumsy plowing boy catch up with her before moving on again. That's so beautiful. Do you, see, do you catch the Edward Thomas <laughs> before you even read Edward Thomas? It must be something proper to yeah. the nature of both of you. Funny, we're talking about Mary Lavin uh, in uh, the middle of the fields. Yes. The first uh, story on that yes. is about wading through grass. <laughs> <laughs> Just came back to me. I was entranced to read that in 1955, the year of my birth, you saw John Gielgud playing Lear. Yes. And you didn't think it was a great production. Yeah. But he, that man playing it, did something to you. And I saw John Gielgud in 1973 playing No Man's Land with Ralph Richardson. And that made me think, rather than, than any play I'd read or literature, that made me think I could work in the theatre. Or that I would love to work in the theatre if this was the terminus. Yes, if this was the, yes. And w That's fascinating, Cause No Gielgud, Man's Land. Yes. Yeah. And Gielgud, a sort of supreme prompt to a playwright, mm. both of these playwrights. Yeah. With 20, is it 20 years between? Yeah. Or longer. And that's just rather astonishing. Gielgud was a very courageous actor. I loved mm. courage in an actor, mm. and Donald had this in spades. Oh my God, talk about confidence. You know, uh, so that they put themselves through the ringer mm. um, in ways that you might not have even kind of sensed mm. when you were writing. Mm. Um, you're, you're given risk taking mm. at an enormous level. Mm. And uh, um, Gilgood's espousal of new writing in the theatre, mm. mm, when he could have rested on his yes. many laurels. He did turn down Godot now. <laughs> he, did. he couldn't make head nor tail of it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. In closing, you see this sort of slightly terrorized individual that I am by a public life has brought me around to this beautiful moment where, which I will cherish all my days, where you and I have sat down and talked about nothing and everything. And I just want to thank you sincerely, lovingly for this experience, oh. Tom Kilroy. Thank you. Pretty nice. Thank you.